we're going to continue with Impressionism in the 19th century. Now, the first artist we're going to talk about is Edouard Manet, and he's not really an Impressionist. Uh, generally, when people are, you know, creating these textbooks and they have to put people under uh, period titles, they'll put him under Impressionism because he influenced the Impressionists. He knew the Impressionist. His sister-in-law, Berth Morisot, was an Impressionist. But he did not exhibit with the Impressionist. And his style, as you'll see, is somewhat different. But what influenced the Impressionist with his work was his interest in light and the actual effects of life, of light, and how he comes to represent artistic freedom, the um, idea of painting the way that you want to paint, not what uh, someone else, the critics, the Royal Academy, you know, uh, not, not how someone else tells you how to paint. This painting by Manet became a kind of pivotal point in art history. It was very controversial, and it came to have a great deal of importance. Some people consider this the first painting of modern art. And they sometimes will start their chapters on modern art with this painting. So that date, 1863, was a kind of pivotal moment in art history. The title of this, which is always given in French, is Déjeuner sur la herbe, or Luncheon on the Grass. And here you see a detail of the picnic, as it were, and you can see that uh, Manet is painting with very uh, free, fluid brushwork. But by this time, that's not shocking. Um, people can exhibit with smoothed out brushwork, very hard edged, painting with disegno, as it were, or they can paint freely with free brushwork. Either one, depending on what they're doing. But this painting shocked the public and the critics when it was exhibited at the Salon des Refusés. So the first thing we have to do is say, well, what's the Salon des Refusés? So we have to go back and discuss the official salon. Now, the word salon just means a large hall. Um, in, in Italian, it would be a sala. Um, but the word salon came to refer to the official juried exhibit of the French Academy. Now, this was a government-sponsored art exhibit, and it was juried. You couldn't just say you wanted to be in it and be in it. And it was very important because to be recognized as a professional artist, you needed to be juried into the, the salon. You know, it was, it was the mark that you were a professional artist. Um, and if you weren't in the salon, your career probably would go nowhere. Almost every year, there was this exhibit known as the salon. Um, sometimes, of course, there was uh, political unrest uh, later on uh, when the Prussians invade in the early 1870s. Of course, they had no salon. Uh, but almost every year, they would have this big exhibit. Now, in 1863, so many works were rejected that the artists protested. And the emperor agreed to give them another exhibit to show their works. And I assume it was something like, oh, give them an exhibit. <laughs> and then everybody will see why we didn't jury them in. Uh, but they did have another exhibit. And it was called the Salon des Refusés, or the exhibition of the rejected or refused works. And people came to it. They wanted to see. So why was the Salon des Refusés of 1863 so important? Well, here are some of the reasons. It introduced the art of Manet to the public and to other artists. 
After all, no matter how innovative an artist you are, if no one sees your work, you're not going to influence anybody. And these kind of overlap a little bit. It came to signify artistic freedom because it undermined the exclusivity of the salon. In other words, these people didn't get into the salon, but they still had their exhibition. Now, it didn't have an immediate change. Um, other things occurred, including uh, in the 1871 and two, the uh, invasion of the Prussians and the um, Franco-Prussian War. But 11 years later, in 1874, um, there was a result. A group of artists got together and put on their own exhibition. And they called themselves the Society of the Anonymous Artists. But we know their exhibition now as the first Impressionist exhibit. And they continued to have exhibits for some years. Okay, so let's go back to 1863. We'll talk about the Impressionists in a short time. When Manet's Déjeuner sur la Herbe was exhibited at the Salon des Réfusés, it shocked the public. They considered it to be an immoral work. Okay, why? Why do you think this painting was so shocking? And of course, some of you will immediately say, well, you, you know, you've got some nudes there. You've got a nude woman. Uh, you've got a woman in sort of transparent, her chemise, you know, it's like a wet t-shirt would be today, I guess. It must have been the nudity. Well, not exactly, uh, because this was the first placed winner of the 1863 official salon. It's Cabanel's Birth of Venus. Uh, it's definitely a nude woman in a very provocative pose, um, but it's been given the name Venus. So she's a classical goddess, and uh, that makes it all all right. Uh, so they had many, many nude figures in the official salon. After all, uh, that was how you, you know, best showed that you could do anatomy, you could do mythological figures. Um, so it wasn't shocking to have a nude figure if it was a fictional goddess. But it was shocking for a 19th century woman to appear nude and out of doors with clothed men. And I say 19th century women because you can see the men are wearing contemporary clothes. Um, you know, these are the clothes that people would wear in 1863. So that's shocking. Now, one of the intriguing things about this was most people didn't realize what Manet was doing. Uh, there was a critic who did realize it, um, but most people looked at this and they never even thought about Renaissance art. But what is Manet doing? He's updating Renaissance art. He's doing a sort of 19th century version uh, that refers to a few paintings from the Renaissance. Uh, one of them is this painting, which has traditionally been attributed to Giorgione. Uh, and then sometimes it has been attributed to Titian. And sometimes people say, well, maybe Giorgione and Titian collaborated. But it is a Georgianesque painting uh, by you know, a famous 16th century painter. Uh, and it's known either as the Fete Champetre or the Pastoral Concert and it's hanging in the Louvre. Now, in this painting, you have two nude women in a landscape, and you have contemporarily dressed, a 16th century dress, uh, on two men who are making music. 
and people would go to the Louvre and they'd look at it and say, oh, what a beautiful Renaissance painting. They would not be shocked because it's 16th century garment. Now, it's contemporary to the artist. But to the 19th century eye, it looks you know, picturesque and long ago and sort of make-believe. And there was another work of Renaissance art that influenced Manet. Uh, this is an engraving uh, by a Renaissance engraver named Marc Antonio Romondi. And he would copy works of art, and sometimes he would work with artists and um, engrave their drawings or their paintings. Um, and he was a, a very successful engraver. Uh, this is a judgment of Paris based on a lost drawing by Raphael. Now remember the 19th century, Raphael was the great god of painting. He was supposed to be the greatest painter who had ever lived. So he's drawing from a Raphael. Uh, the subject here is from classical antiquity. Uh, Paris, that's the seated figure, was a uh, prince of Troy. And he was chosen to decide which of the three goddesses was the most beautiful, Juno or Hera, uh, Venus, Aphrodite, Minerva, Athena. And they all offered him bribes, and he took Venus's bribe. Uh, she said that he would be able to marry the most beautiful woman in the world. She didn't mention, and he didn't ask, uh, but that most beautiful woman was already married to a Greek king. And the result was the Trojan War. Um, this, the drawing is in part also based on some classical sarcophagi that are in the Vatican. So, you know, this has, like I say, very good credentials. Uh, it's a classical mythological theme. Uh, it's by, the, the design is by Raphael. And what does Manet do? He uses the three figures who are seated uh, on the right side. And his main figures are in exactly the same pose. He's drawn them from these river gods. So what he's doing is updating Renaissance art, in a sense, putting it in a 19th century context. Now, there was one thing about the style that also bothered people. They felt that the figures appeared to be flattened, that they, they weren't modeled in chiaroscuro to seem solid and volumetric. And there's a reason for that. Manet looked at the actual effect of bright sunlight. And he realized that when something is in bright sunlight, uh, the shadows often disappear or almost disappear. Uh, if you look at the woman, you'll see a little shadow under her thigh, and under her knee, and under her elbow. Uh, but you know, much of her body is not rounded in dark, medium, light tones. It, it does appear somewhat flattened. And when you look at the men and their garments, they are wearing these black uh, jackets, and there is some different tones in there, some you know, dark grays, for example. But once again, it's not the traditional um, showing on the side that's furthest from the light source, you have the darkest color. And then a little further, it's the medium tone. And then the highlights are the lightest tone. Um, you know, it also appears flattened. But Manet did that because he realized that's exactly what real sunlight would do. So rather than following rules about art and uh, things that you know people had been doing for centuries, uh, he actually observed and then showed his observations in his painting. Now as I said, many people regard this as the beginning of modern art because it's come to mean artistic freedom and originality. And it embodies a concept that is much associated with modern art, and that's art for art's sake. 
Okay, during this course, we've looked at art with a lot of different functions. We've seen art that's supposed to help save your soul. We've seen art that tells you that the queen is wonderful. <laughs> um, you know, which is uh, political propaganda sometimes. Uh, we've seen art that protests against cruelty. We've seen art that shows that you are wealthy and uh, can have something uh, beautiful hanging on your wall, which helps show your social status. Uh, we've seen art that uh, records people's appearance and social status for future generations, portraits. But now we're looking at a different kind of art. This is art that doesn't have to have an excuse. Um, it doesn't have to teach you a moral lesson. In fact, some people thought this work was immoral, but really it's amoral. It doesn't say go out and have picnics in the nude, and it doesn't say, don't go out and have picnics in the nude. It's not telling you to do something. It doesn't have an external function. It doesn't have a moral. You know, it, it, it's art. It's art, and it's created to be art. So, you know, today, if you ask an artist, well, What's the function of your art? What's it supposed to do? Some artists will have a function and they'll tell you. And others may just look at you and say, it's art. Art doesn't need a function. It's art for art's sake. OK, let's look at one other example of um, Manet's painting. And that is his painting of Olympia, it's the woman's name, uh, from, once again, 1863. And this may remind you of another Renaissance painting that you've already seen in class. This is based on Titian's Venus of Urbino. And of course, Titian's Venus of Urbino looks like, you know, a beautiful woman reclining on a bed in a 16th century villa uh, with servants to attend her. Uh, it's Venus simply because that's the name that's been given to it. Now, with Manet's version, the woman is a prostitute. And her servant is bringing in uh, a bouquet of flowers that uh, one of her admirers has left. She's uh, probably a higher class prostitute. Uh, people are wooing her. Um, her form is a little bit more angular than the curving forms of Titian's Venus of Urbino. They both look at us, but Olympia has a very direct gaze, which was uh, somewhat disconcerting to some people. And one of the faults that was cited was Courbet. Uh, you know, even some of the realist painters didn't like this. Uh, Courbet said, it's, it's flat. It looks like a playing card. And you look at it, there's not a lot of chiaroscuro. You know, there's not uh, modeled so she looks solid and volumetric. Just uh, little bits of shadow. So once again, that idea of bright light uh, can remove shadows. Um, within the figure. And here we see some details. Um, Olympia has a cat instead of uh, Venus's dog. Now, this idea about light was something that was so influential to um, a group of painters that we today know as the Impressionists. And they were interested in painting the transitory effect of light and atmosphere. Now, what I often do for time is just to emphasize uh, two of the Impressionists, uh, Claude Monet, and you must uh, be able to distinguish between Manet and Monet. It's not a, a slight misspelling if you uh, change out 
the vowel, the A or the O, it's, uh, it's wrong uh, because you're referring to a different person if you were to uh, think that Manet painted Monet's paintings. So be aware of that. Um, but there's two artists that I usually emphasize. One is Claude Monet and the other is Mary Cassatt. Uh, but we're also going to talk about uh, some of the work of Renoir, Degas, and Berthe Borisot. Impressionists were interested in the transitory effect of light and atmosphere. And they realized that light could even dissolve the form, in other words, uh, dissolve the appearance of solidity. And to do this, they would often use very light pastel hues, and they liked to paint out of doors in what they called plein air, open air. Um, and Monet is a very good example of that. So we're looking here at you know, one Monet painting. I'm going to just going to show you quickly. Uh, some. This uh, was in earlier editions of your text. And this is uh, a picture that I took myself uh, because I could go to the museum. It's in the National Gallery in Washington, and they let you take pictures there. And uh, so I will be able to show you some details here. Uh, they often used a te technique known as broken color in which they would apply their paint in dabs of color with different colors next to each other, but not smoothed together. They're just absolutely separate uh, strokes of the, of the brush. And the theory was that the eye would mix the color. So if you put, uh, you know, blue next to yellow, you know, your eye would see green. Actually, of course, you frequently are very much aware of the different hues, and it makes a very lively uh, surface. But think about it. Light is all colors. So it makes sense to use, you know, many different hues. And uh, here I'm just going to show you some of the details. And you could also see that uh, the paint, the paint can be very thick in places. You know, you have a real uh, texture to the surface. Okay. Remind you of that first Impressionist exhibit. In 1874, a group of artists got together and put on their own exhibition of paintings. Now, they weren't all what we today call the Impressionists. They were different styles. And, you know, they rented a hall. They uh, made a catalog. They made posters, did their own publicity. And people came. Public came, the critics came, and they saw, among other things, one of these paintings. Uh, both of these paintings are called Impression Sunrise. Uh, they're both by Claude Monet. Uh, the image on the left is the one that traditionally has been considered to be the picture that he exhibited under the name Impression Sunrise. Uh, and it has the date of 72 on it. So uh, he could have exhibited in 74. The other one has also been suggested as possibly uh, the Impression Sunrise that was shown. So I guess we don't really know. Uh, but this is the one that is uh, usually shown. Okay, he's showing you very freely painted scene of the harbor. Uh, it's a very foggy morning. Uh, some of the, the boats and the shore you can barely see. Uh, the sun is rising and sheds uh, some light uh, in a, on the water and on the sky, but we can't really make out any details at all. You know, it's it's brushwork, and much of the same is true of this version of the painting. Although the the um, sailboat in the foreground is much larger. Well. 
One of the disapproving critics focused on that painting. And he, he thought that the artists were not creating properly finished works. And he picked up on the title. And he just thinks that this is a fraud. You know, they're just putting unfinished things, just sloppily put together. They're just showing an impression. They're, they're nothing but impressionists. He meant it badly. But the artists liked that name. And so they started using it. So essentially, it was a pejorative term uh, that the artist turned into a positive. Now, Monet paints series of paintings. Um, he will show paint. Uh, he blah, blah, blah. now Monet painted many series of paintings. For example, he painted the Gare Saint Lazare, the train station. Uh, he painted. Uh, grain stacks. Sometimes no one's haystacks, but they've decided now they're grain stacks. Um, and in the 1890s, he did a whole series of paintings of Rouen Cathedral in different times, uh, in different weather, with different atmospheric conditions. Now, when you're painting like these dabs of paint and all the juxtaposed colors, it almost seems to dissolve the form, to dissolve the, the physical structure of the cathedral. I can't use these paintings by Monet in my medieval art course. I can't use them to show the structure of the Gothic church or uh, what sculpture was decorating the facade or what's in the stained glass window because we can't see those things. What we're seeing is a painting of light on the surface rather than you know, the architectural de details of a Gothic church. Uh, here is an example in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, and here is uh, the one in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. And there are just many, many versions of these. The story is told that Monet goes out and paints in nature. He paints from the motif. That's what they called uh, whatever they were painting. And you know the artists now were able to do that because they had um, they now had manufactured paints uh, that came in uh, tubes, and you could put them in a box uh, and you could take them to different places. You didn't have to grind up the pigments in your studio and mix them in your studio. And they could take a portable easel and a little fold-up stool and their painting box and a bunch of canvases and go out and sit themselves down in front of the motif. And the story is that they would paint for as long as the light was pretty much the same way. But then, you know, clouds might come up or the fog burns off or uh, the sun goes across the heavens and the lighting conditions change. So they have to change to another canvas. But the idea was that they were working directly in nature and trying to capture the effect of light in nature. Now, with these particular paintings, Monet starts in nature and he does take them back and work on them in the studio. And we do have some details here, and you can see how uh, rough the, the uh, texture of the paint is, how it's, it's built up, and how all these little dabs of painting, you know, give you this kind of amorphous feeling rather than defining a hard-edged form. And just to show you something else, um, Monet also painted a series of water lilies. Now, this was a long series of paintings, painted over decades. And he's painting the water lily pond at his home at Gervinet. The late paintings you're going to see almost seem to have you know, almost no subject. They look almost abstract, but they are water lilies. And they are enveloped in light and color. So here we see, sort of standing off, we can see the Japanese bridge and we can see the water lily pond and some of the shrubbery growing at either side. 
Uh, and here's a somewhat later one. And we're looking in and we're just seeing the water lilies uh, on the surface of the water and uh, some of the light reflections in the water. And then one of his later ones, if we didn't tell you this was water lilies, you might not realize it. You might think that this was a totally abstract painting that had no subject. Uh, but you can see how the, the form is being dissolved and uh, you know he's showing basically light and color and paint strokes. Berthe Morisot uh, was one of the original Impressionists. And she wasn't an Impressionist because she couldn't get into the Salon. She was accepted to the Salon. So she could have continued to, you know, paint for the Salon. Um, she wasn't accepted every year, but she'd gotten work in. But she decided she wanted to work with these more radical painters. Uh, she knew Manet, and I'll tell you a little bit about her life. Uh, she's from the upper middle class. Um, and her parents are very interested in art. They have artists over for dinner. You know, they were friends of uh, Manet and Corot and, and other people. Uh, and they arranged to have art lessons for their daughters. Uh, that was something that was seen as a genteel accomplishment. And every lady should learn to uh, do a little drawing and painting. But they weren't expected to be professionals. And one day, um, their painting teacher goes to their mother and says, you know, Madam, if you let your daughters continue to paint art, they won't have just some nice ladylike little um, avocation. He doesn't use that word, I'm paraphrasing. They will become painters, and that would be a disaster. In other words, women should not be professional painters. It is a social disaster. Well, her parents let her continue to take art lessons. Uh, her sister did get married and, as far as we know, gave up painting, unless she did it you know, just for herself. Um, but Berth Morisot continued and became a professional painter. Uh, she did marry. She married uh, Manet's brother, Edgar Manet. Um, and she had modeled for uh, Edouard Manet. Now, when I say model, don't get in your head nude model. She wasn't. She was a respectable girl. She modeled fully dressed from her neck to her toes, and sometimes even with a hat on. Um, so, uh, but she, she you know, knew Manet, uh, but she goes this other route. She decides she's going to exhibit with the Impressionists, and she exhibits every year from the first year that the Impressionists have their Society of Anonymous Artists exhibit. Every year that they do, except for one year, and that one year she was having her baby. She gave birth to a daughter. Um, so we'll, we can understand why she did not exhibit that one year. Women were not as free to go out and just paint from the landscape. So we have relatively few paintings um, you know, of a landscape out in nature uh, from the female artists, um, more paintings um, in their home. But she does paint some. Uh, she, there's one that's a scene from a, a view of Paris from a place near her home. So you know, she could go out and be chaperoned or when the family goes on vacation, or in this case, you know, a summer outing. This is a, a summer's day, uh, and the young ladies are going to the park that has a, uh, a pond or a lake, and they're taking a little boat ride. Uh, so it's, you know, sort of uh, upper middle class activities. And you can see how beautifully free her brushwork is, uh, filled with light, and how she maintains to give you the feeling of, you know, a, a sol solid form and yet um, this incredibly free brushwork. So she's, she really is just a marvel at painting. Uh, some of the details, if you got really, really close, you might even not recognize, you know, what exactly it is. 